My name is Dave Hillary. Um, I'm with Heimland's uh, CPAs and Advisors. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the first, or at least for this chamber, the uh, first annual economic forecast luncheon sponsored by the Central Maryland Chamber of Commerce. Um, I would like to introduce, initially I'd like the board of directors of the chamber to stand, wave your hands, and please recognize them because my board members and people who work with us put a lot of effort out here. So if you all either stand up, raise your hands, and we know where you are, because I see you guys out there. Thank you very much. Give everybody, give them a round of applause. Thank you. <clears throat> we have an exciting program planned for you, and we don't have lots of time, so I'm going to get this moving along as quickly as I can, for your benefit as well as mine. Um, before I begin, we do like want to recognize uh, key political people and people who've come to this event and some of them who, who will be our speakers. So I will start by just running down the list, uh, starting with uh, Senator Chris Van Hollen, Congressman John Sarvings, John, the Anne County Executive Steve Shue, Colonel Tom Rickard from the Fort Meade Command, Judy Emmo from the National Security Agency, Steve uh, Umberger uh, from the District Director of the Small Business, SBA, Small Business Administration, <laughs> Julia Musog, uh, President and CEO of the Economic Development uh, Council of Anne Arundel County, <laughs> Dr. Pradeep uh, Ganguly, Executive Vice President of the Prince George's County Economic Development Corporation, Mark Thompson, Vice President of Business Development for Howard County Economic Development. <laughs> Dave Helmecki, on behalf of the Anne Arundel County Councilman Andrew Prusky. <laughs> and finally of the group, Nick Vaughn, who is the District Director of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> Did I miss anybody? Oh, we're doing better than we, we usually do sometimes, and thank you very much. Um, I would also like to take a moment to thank, thank all the sponsors who really make these kind of programs uh, possible. To save time, I'm not going to go through the list for you. Uh, all the sponsors are listed in the event programs. In addition to that, in the, in the, there is the agenda and also the bios for each of the speakers. As you'll see in the program, we have a very packed agenda, so I want to get started with our first speaker. Um, elected to the United States Senate by the people of Maryland in November of 2016, Senator Chris Van Hollen is committed to fighting the everyday to ensure that our state and our country live up to their full promise. Senator Van Hollen started his time in public service as a member of the Maryland State Legislature. In 2002, he was elected to represent Maryland's 8th Congressional District. In the House of Representatives, he serves as, as a member of the Democratic leadership and was elected by his colleagues to be the ranking member of the House Budget Committee. A tireless fighter for the people of Maryland, Senator Van Hollen has also become known for working hard to find common sense solutions to difficult national issues. Senator Van Hollen is a graduate of Swarthmore College, the John F. Kennedy School of Public Policy at Harvard, and Georgetown University Law Center. I would like to invite Senator Van Hollen for some welcoming remarks. Senator. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you, Dave. It's great to be with all of you uh, at the Central Maryland Chamber today. And to County Executive Steve Shue, great to join uh, with you. I don't know if my colleague uh, John Sarbanes has arrived. I know John Sarbanes uh, is with us as well. Thank you very much uh, for being part of uh, Team Maryland. And thank all of you here at the Chamber for being the folks uh, who, together with your colleagues in business, help power our economy uh, here in Central Maryland and around our state. And I started the day today uh, over with the uh, Maryland Military Installation uh, Council. Uh, and obviously, our military installations around our state play an important role for our national security. 
Uh, they also uh, play an important role in job creation and powering our local economies. And of course, uh, Fort Meade uh, is one of the largest and most important from our national security perspective, and we're really thrilled uh, to see Colonel Rickert, who's here. We were together this morning. If we give him another round of applause and thank him uh, for his work at as the garrison commander there. And as all of you know, that's home to the NSA and to the Cyber Command. Uh, the Cyber Command is, of course, being elevated now to a unified uh, command. And when that transition officially takes place, I think you're gonna see even a greater demand uh, for resources uh, coming into Fort Meade. Uh, if you look at Fort Meade, if you look at Fort Detrick, if you look at Aberdeen Proving Ground, uh, these are really important national defense assets, uh, but they're also uh, helping to grow in a lot of important uh, technologies uh, here in the state of Maryland. And of course, with respect to Fort Meade, we're talking about a great influx and investment when it comes to cybersecurity. Uh, and John Sarbanes and I and others were just talking uh, earlier today, and it's obviously been an important topic of national conversation uh, dealing with the cyber threat, uh, which is the threat to the private sector, everyone from small businesses to the biggest banks, uh, and to the public sector, everything from uh, local government to the federal government, OPM, and of course, um, our election system ultimately needs to be safeguarded. So uh, we have a huge national uh, focus now, obviously, on cybersecurity, and right here in this region, uh, we are not just the national headquarters, but becoming sort of the international a place to come uh, for people who are investing in uh, cybersecurity. Uh, with that, of course, uh, brings lots of issues regarding infrastructure, and we look forward to working with you and the county executive and the legislature uh, in terms of providing the necessary infrastructure, uh, both at Fort Meade and around. I always have the privilege of meeting with the Fort Meade Alliance, and they're, of course, very committed uh, to working together in partnership uh, with our uh, friends on the base. Uh, but we have a lot of infrastructure challenges here in Central Maryland, as we do across the state and around the country. And one of the things I do hope we get to uh, at the national level is a national strategy and investment uh, to modernize uh, our infrastructure. Uh, that enjoys very strong bipartisan support, and I think a lot of us wish we were uh, really jumping into that uh, right now. But we'll see how all that plays out, uh, but we know here in Maryland we need it. And we're, of course, not just talking about roads and bridges, but also our ports uh, and our airports like BWI, uh, which is such an important hub, uh, building out broadband and all the elements of our national infrastructure, which desperately need to be modernized. And we know that our international competitors are now following our lead from many decades ago, where they're investing a lot in their infrastructure, and it's making them more productive uh, and clearly competing more and more with us uh, on the global front. So uh, as we deal with the issues around uh, Fort Meade uh, infrastructure, we also need to deal with our workforce development uh, issues. And that is a great opportunity, right? It's a great opportunity for students in Maryland uh, if we're prepared to make sure that they have the tools uh, they need uh, for the jobs that will be offered right here and around the country uh, in this 21st century. And so we've got to make sure that we invest those resources at the federal level uh, the state level and at the local level uh, in doing that. And I look forward to working with you. I, I serve on the Appropriations Committee. Um, it took a little doing. Senator Mikulski, of course, did a great job uh, for the state of Maryland on the Appropriations Committee. In fact, one of the first uh, visits uh, we made together um, last year uh, was to uh, Fort Meade, uh, where we took a full uh, a tour of all the different facilities uh, there as well. We look forward to working with you on that uh, going forward. I do want to say a word about uh, the two things. Uh, one has to do with the, in, the continuing resolution that's before us right now. So Maryland, uh, partly because of geography, uh, does very well when it comes to federal investments. That's probably not a surprise to you, but uh, we are ranked number three in the country in terms of the amount of dollars the federal government spends on goods and services, procurement. Uh, we are number four in absolute dollar terms, uh, only after California, Texas, big states, and Virginia. And that obviously is a, a big opportunity. It also means 
uh, that as we diversify our economy, those of us um, who are involved at the federal level want to work to make sure that uh, we continue uh, to be at the cutting edge because the reason we do well in federal investment in addition to proximity is uh, that we have the talent and the workforce here in the state of Maryland that can provide those services uh, to the federal government. So we need to make sure that we maintain that. Right now in Congress, uh, we're operating under what's called a continuing resolution, right? We're just sort of on automatic pilot from last year. Our fiscal year starts October 1st. The current continuing resolution will ex expire on December 12th. If we don't come together on a bipartisan basis after that, uh, you could see the sequester cook into place. These are these uh, very deep automatic cuts in both defense and non-defense, uh, which I think on a bipartisan basis many people believe and I believe uh, would be uh, bad for the country, uh, be bad for our national security posture, uh, be bad for our economy because it means less investment in, in infrastructure uh, and education. Uh, and so it's really important that we deal with that issue. Uh, otherwise, when we get to December 12th, uh, you're going to see some very uh, dramatic uh, changes in terms of the investment uh, on both defense and non-defense side. So we're working to try to address that. The second thing, which of course is on a lot of people's minds, is the tax uh, bill, tax policy bill, tax reform bill. And we don't know exactly what's in that. I'm sure that'll be the top of, of conversation today. Uh, and we don't know because we expect to see Wednesday uh, is when it will be unveiled uh, by the House Ways and Means uh, Committee. And uh, so it's going to be really important that we fully analyze uh, this legislation as a state and the country to understand what impact it will have. Here's what we do know uh, so far from what we've seen. Uh, we do know that it will add dramatically uh, to our federal debt. Now, I'm in favor of tax reform. I think we need to simplify our tax system at the federal level. But I also don't think, as a country, we should be taking on a whole lot more red ink. And the budget that has passed uh, calls for an increase in the federal debt of $1.5 trillion. Now, maybe at the end of the bill day, this tax bill will not be $1.5 trillion. Maybe it'll be more, maybe it'll be less. But I would just urge all of you to take that into account because those are additional obligations we take on when the United States already is at very high debt levels. And over time, taking on added federal debt will continue to will squeeze out economic growth in the out years uh, and have a break potentially on the economy. So I would flag that issue uh, to look at. The other thing to be very aware of uh, is a provision that's been hotly debated, uh, which has to do with the deductibility of state and local taxes. And I know county executive uh, has probably looked at this. I know at the state level people have looked at this. The National Association of Counties and the National Association of Governors have come out opposed to this bill because of the double taxation it would create if, if you do not allow the deductibility of state and local taxes. Maryland happens to be close to the top in the country. I think we may be close to the top in terms of the number of itemizers who also take the state and local deduction. We're at about 50%. Uh, and it amounted, according to the Tax Foundation, to about, I believe it was $16 billion. Uh, yes, yeah, $16 billion uh, that Marylanders deducted from their federal taxes. So we are way up there because we're a state that has both property taxes and, of course, a state income tax. So from a state perspective, I think it's really important that everybody focus on this because a lot of the services that are provided in the state, of course, come from local and state uh, government. So I would, I would pay attention to this. Uh, the National Home Builders Association just came out against the bill based on what they've seen. And the National Association of Realtors have raised lots of issues. They commissioned a Standard & Poor's a study uh, that, at least under the version of the bill that they knew about two weeks ago, uh, would have meant that if you're a homeowner between $50,000 and $200,000 adjusted gross income, uh, you will, on average, see a tax increase. Uh, that's according to PricewaterhouseCoopers' study commissioned by the National Association of Realtors. So, 
The bottom line is we don't know all the details because they've sort of been kept secret. But what we know from what's leaking out are the reactions we've gotten from groups like the National Home Builders Association, National Realtors. So my only request to everybody here is to really follow this debate closely. Also, when there are independent groups like the Congressional Budget Office that is a bunch of, you know, these guys do budgets. That's what they do. They're pros. They're not Democrats or Republicans. When they come out with analysis, if you hear people criticizing their analysis about how much it will add to the debt, I would, I, I, I would just stick with the professionals. I don't always agree with the Congressional Budget Office. None of us do. But you need a referee on the field when you're making assessments uh, for Congress. Uh, and you need somebody who's independent, who can call the balls and strikes as they see them. So I would take a look at what they're saying with respect to uh, the impact of this bill. And finally, just ask all of you uh, to, to do your jobs as citizens uh, and as representatives of business and uh, give us the feedback that we need uh, based on your assessment uh, of this legislation. Uh, because we all want to see our economy grow. We want to see it grow here. We want it th throughout the state uh, and throughout the country. Uh, and we want to make sure that we don't do anything to uh, interfere or undermine what clearly is an economy that can has continued to grow. We've seen economic growth, growth uh, uh, over many, 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 many months now and years. So, but it's increasing, and we need to maintain that because um, that's. Uh, important to our standard of living for ourselves and our kids and grandkids. So thank all of you for being here. Um, and I know that Congressman Sarbanes and I and County Executive Shu look forward to your continued input uh, on these really important issues uh, to our county, to our state, and to our country. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Senator Van Hollen. We really appreciate you making time in your busy schedule to come join us this morning, or is it afternoon yet? Almost there, almost afternoon. Um, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Raj Kachabkar. I am the CEO of the Central Maryland Chamber, and uh, tomorrow is gonna be my one year anniversary with the Chamber. So. Um, you know, I was very lucky to uh, adopt for lack of a better term, uh, two great chambers, the Baltimore Washington Corridor Chamber and the West Anne Arundel County Chamber, and merge those two chambers together. Uh, I'm blessed to have a wonderful board that's worked very closely with me. And you know, as we're going through our first year and we're doing all these events, every time we do an event, each one gets better, better, and better. And just to see all of you out here today, to really learn uh, and get a better grasp of how our economy, our ecosystem, uh, is moving. Uh, it's excellent to see. Um, I'm excited about today's program because we have so many dynamic speakers who are in important positions to influence the direction of our regional business ecosystem. They also have knowledge that will help you best position your business for success. I actually recently had dinner with billionaire Mike Bloomberg. I uh, got very lucky. It was a couple of months ago, just the two of us chatting, and I said, you know, Mike, actually I didn't call him Mike, I said, Mr. Bloomberg, uh, I, I uh, just joined uh, this chamber, I'm the new CEO, and if I was going to give the businesses in my chamber advice, what is the key to their success? And he said it was simple, it's data, it's business intelligence. To get to the heart of Mike Bloomberg's business, you have to understand data. And I'm sure most of you sitting in the audience today, you've heard of the Bloomberg Terminal. The Bloomberg Terminal is a system that makes up over 85% of Bloomberg's annual revenue. The Bloomberg Terminal allows professionals in the financial service sector to access and analyze financial market data. Consider this event your Bloomberg Terminal. You will get key data and intel to help support your business, and you won't have to pay $25,000 like the Bloomberg Terminal. In an effort to get you as much intel as possible, I would like to call up our next speaker. 
Anne Arundel County Executive Steve Hsu was elected in 2014 on a platform to make Anne Arundel County the best place to live, work, and start a business in Maryland. His plan includes reducing taxes and fees, working to build smaller neighborhood schools, improving public safety, reforming county government to make it more efficient and cost effective, and improving our citizens' quality of life. County Executive Hsu has been in business for over 30 years. He is a former manage, managing director of Alex Brown and & Sons and Credit Suisse. He is a founder of Mid-State Management Group, which develops and operates restaurants that employ over 1,000 individuals in our region. County Executive Hsu was raised in Crofton and served in the House of Delegates for eight years representing District, District 31. He holds a bachelor's degree in economics and government from Dartmouth College, a master's degree in business and education from Harvard University and Johns Hopkins University. He is a father of two grown children, Brittany and George, and is married to Dania Blair Shu. Please join me in welcoming County Exec Shu to the podium. Thank you, Raj, and congratulations on the uh, one-year anniversary of your, your position here with the Chamber and the merger, which seems to have gone very, very well. And welcome to all of you this morning, or this afternoon, I should say. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you for this exciting event. I thought I'd take a little bit of time to talk about Anne Arundel County and uh, how things have changed in this county over the last few decades. Uh, as, as Raj mentioned, I grew up in Crofton back in the... Uh, early mid-60s. And back then, Anne Arundel County was a very, very different place. It was still a rural backwater, a very small economy, a very small population. And uh, outside of the US Naval Academy, there was basically nothing going on of statewide, much less national importance. We did have a small little airport, Friendship Airport. Remember that? A few heads nodding there. A ramshackled old army base at Fort Meade back in the day. And uh, Annapolis had been asleep for 150 years at that point. All that has now utterly changed. We now have a 40, I just found out the other day, uh, Julie Mossog just let me know that our economy just recently crossed over $40 billion. So we now have the fourth largest local economy in the state of Maryland, a population of 570,000 people. And at current growth rates, we will soon surpass that of the city of Baltimore. And we are today host to many of the state's most critical assets, including what is now the third largest army base in the United States, Fort Meade. National Security Agency, whose immense importance to national security cannot be over, overstated. And what has now become the state's only international airport, BWI Thurgood Marshall, just to name a few. And of course, Annapolis has become one of the largest tourist destinations on the East Coast. And uh, we're still the home of the Naval Academy, very proud of our Naval Academy. Our jurisdiction's prosperous. We have a very low unemployment rate, now 3.5% and probably lower, because I think the numbers are having trouble keeping up. 90,000 median household income, which puts us in the top 25 of 3,000 counties around the country. So this is a, a well-to-do jurisdiction. Nearly 23% of our residents have a bachelor's degree and another 16 have master's degrees or higher. We've added 30,000 jobs just over the last uh, post-recessionary period. The main driver for a lot of that growth and a lot of that change is right here in West Anne Arundel County, here near BWI, both of which are home to many of the critical assets I just mentioned a moment ago. Thanks to many of the members of the Central Maryland Chamber, Anne Arundel County is now one of the most important jurisdictions, if not the most important, important jurisdiction in Maryland, and is, I believe, on the brink of statewide leadership from a policy perspective. Our administration is committed to maintaining the positive momentum that this county has enjoyed for several decades now. We, uh, as Raj said, are determined to, to do what we can do to help make our county be the best place to live, work, and start a business in Maryland. We're very serious about that. We put in place a series of policy initiatives that all represent significant breaks with past practice here in our county. We uh, determined to reduce taxes and fees, 
to improve public ed education, particularly by accelerating construction of schools and in particular smaller neighborhood schools, improving public safety to fight back against heroin and gangs. In Little County is a very safe jurisdiction, but make no mistake, the gangs are here. They're here in enough that we need to be concerned about it, and heroin is most definitely in this community. We are on track to have a thousand overdoses in Amarillo County this year, and there will probably be more than 200 fatalities, I'm sorry to say. We are working hard to reform county government to make it more efficient and customer friendly, particularly in the area of land use, which I know affects many of you. And we're working hard to improve the quality of life for the citizens in this county by cleaning up our waterways and investing in recreational infrastructure. I believe that all these initiatives will not only help Anne Arundel County reach its full potential, but will position us as a tax-friendly, safe, and efficient jurisdiction with a superior educational system where businesses will want to locate and expand. I'm happy to report that we're now you know, three years into the implementation of that basic business plan I laid out for you, and we've made pretty good progress. We've introduced the largest tax cut and the largest fee cut in county history. We've included three property rate tax cuts in our budgets thanks to our property tax revenue cap. We've eliminated several categories of taxation entirely and all told cumulative, cumulatively those tax and fee cuts aggregate $67 million so far. In terms of school construction, we are now in the midst of the largest school construction effort in Anne Arundel County history. We will be building new high schools in Crofton, Old Mill, and out in West County to serve the Fort Meade and NSA communities. With respect to public safety, we are also in the midst of a very substantial investment program in public safety. We are constructing a new central booking facility. That's a game changer for law enforcement in this county. And a new police academy. We have purchased so far about 550 new police vehicles to bring the average age of our fleet down to three years, which was our target. And we've added over 40 public safety professionals to our, to our force. With respect to government reform, full speed ahead, we have uh, made major changes in our land use departments. If any of you has gone in for a permit lately, I hope you found it a very different experience from that which you may have experienced several years ago. Statistically speaking, our permitting times are down rather dramatically from where they were in 2014. In some cases, we're down 60 and 65 percent in site review and other land use determinations. We've also launched the largest technology effort in the county his in the history of this county, $50 million to upgrade our technology in 21st century standards. And I'm pleased to report that our budget is balanced. In fact, not only is it balanced, we are this year in a budgetary surplus position. First time since 2008 we've had a balanced budget. And finally, quality of life. We are uh, moving very quickly to clean up our waterways. We are going to be devoting $250 million in 300 separate projects over the next six years to clean up the incredible natural bounty of the waterways here in Anaheim County. We have 530 miles of waterway, more miles of tidal shoreline than any other jurisdiction in Maryland. It's important we take care of those waterways. And we're also expanding on our infrastructure for recreational purposes. We are building out a whole network of bike trails, a very large project, $35 million, new trailer boat ramps, canoe and kayak launches, new libraries, opening up beaches for swimming, to swimming for the first time in decades. Many of them had been closed. So all these initiatives are, are coming together to helping our county achieve what I believe is its immense potential and to, to make it the best place to live, work, and start a business in the state. So I want to thank you again for having me here today and thank you for participating in this lunch and I hope you have a great day. Thank you. He split his professional time between Venable and the Maryland State Department of Education so that he could be involved in education policy even as he continued to practice law.
Congressman Sarbanes graduated from the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton University and studied law and politics in Greece as a Fulbright scholar. I tried for a Fulbright, I didn't get it. Um, he then graduated from Harvard Law School. Born and raised in Baltimore, Congressman Sarbanes and his family live in Townsend. Now please join me in welcoming Congressman John Sarbanes to the podium. Thank you, Raj. I'm going to be I'm going to be very brief, so you can get to the the main speakers of the day. And you you have already received a very good overview of what's happening at the federal level from Senator Van Hollen and what's happening here in Anne Arundel County uh, from County Executive uh, Shu. Um, I just want to really be the part of the the agenda that thanks the chamber and commends the chamber and its team for being such an incredible resource here. Now, not just in Arundel County, uh, with the combination, really we're talking about a footprint in central Maryland, Howard County, uh, Prince George's County, and so forth. And it's important to have that broad uh, perspective now that Raj and, and Dave and the whole team of the uh, central Maryland chamber are bringing because if you're going to do the networking, if you're going to get the support and the information and the data, as Raj indicated, that will allow you to grow your businesses and be successful, that broad kind of perspective is really, is really critical. Um, I also want to salute Colonel Rickard, who we're going to hear from in a moment. We've really been blessed at Ford Meade with tremendous leadership and a continuity of leadership and expertise that really, I think, is unrivaled when you look around the country. There's always a lot going on at Fort Meade, on the base, as well as around Fort Meade, in terms of infrastructure, upgrades, uh, connecting with the community. And each base commander that has come in, uh, from the time I can uh, certainly remember and before has has stepped seamlessly into the shoes of their predecessor to make sure that all these important uh, partnerships are maintained. So, Colonel, we thank you for for your leadership there at the base, and we look forward to hearing from you uh, today. I'll just close with this: I had the chance uh, recently to do a windshield tour uh, with Raj. Um, in, at the Odin, go around and see the Odenton Town Center. Now that's just one small project within the uh, jurisdiction of the chamber, but I got to see how connected the chamber is to making sure that as the Odenton Town Center is growing, that good decisions are being made, decisions that involve businesses at all levels that are connected to the community priorities. And if that tour and the conversation we had is any example of how you're handling uh, the kind of assessment you're doing across the jurisdiction of the chamber, then this area, this region is in very, very good hands as a result of the chamber's work. So congratulations on that. Congratulations to your team. And I'm sure what most people are going to want to know today is how you got to have a private dinner with Michael Bloomberg, but we can talk about that later. Thank you all very much. Take care. Thank you, Congressman Sarbanes. Um, on to our next speaker. Fort Meade is the largest economic engine in the state of Maryland and at the heart of our region. That is why I'm extremely pleased that the current Fort Meade Garrison Commander, Colonel Tom Rickard, is able to join us today. Colonel Rickard was commissioned in the regular Army as an infantry officer in 1990 through the Reserve Officers Training Corps at Georgia Institute of Technology. He has many successful assignments, way too many to mention, but all included uh, in the bio section of your program. And you'll see he actually has the longest bio in that program. I think you can combine all the other bios. They're still shorter than his bio. Um, but it's important that you know that Colonel Rickard earned a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from Georgia Tech, 
a master's of science and administration in human resources from Central Michigan University, where my brother-in-law went to school, and the Master's of Science in Joint Campaign Planning and Strategy from Def National Defense University. His awards and decorations include the Combat Infantry Badge, the Expert Infantry Badge, Ranger Tab, Parachutist Badge, Air Assault Badge, Valorious Unit Award, two, uh, Joint Meritorious Unit Award, Meritorious Unit Commendation, Defense Superior Service Medal. Now you know why I couldn't go through his whole entire bio. The Bronze Star, Defense Mator Meritorious Service Medal, and Mer Meritorious Seminal S Service Medal, seven of them, Joint Service Condem Condemnation Medal, Army Condemnation Medal, Army Achievement Medal, an Afghan Campaign Medal, Iraq Campaign Medal, and the Korean Defense Service Medal. I think I got all of them. Um, please join me in welcoming Colonel Rickard to the podium. Good afternoon. And uh, thank you very much, Raj. I wish I were half as great as my bio. Um, <laughs> I can't do that. Uh, Senator Van Hollen, uh, Congressman Sarbanes, County Executive Shu, uh, and special thanks again to Raj and everyone from the Central Maryland Chamber of Commerce for putting this on. I'm very grateful and honored uh, to be part of this group. Uh, a little humbled, actually, because I'm not an economist. Uh, so talking to a group about economic things, I'm, I'm the small guy in the room, really. Uh, like he said, I'm a civil engineer by background, which means I can spell infrastructure. Um, but as an infantry guy, I spent most of my time crawling around in soil, and I've got my favorites, but uh, that's what I spent most of my time doing. Uh, so what I want to offer you today is uh, I've just got one chart, and if you can't see it, that's fine. I didn't bring my glasses either. Um, but what I want to do is talk a little bit about an update for Fort Meade, and then a little bit about thoughts on the future, what I think is going to be happening. And some of this is my opinion. Some of this is based on uh, some credible research, uh, if, if you can believe that. Uh, so first, Fort Meade, we're, we're extremely grateful for the outstanding support uh, from our community covenant council. So the Central Maryland Chamber, uh, Howard County Chamber, the Fort Meade Alliance, the BWI partnership, uh, great relationships with our county, state, and federal government leaders. Uh, thank you. We are very, very grateful for all that we have. And I know the difference, having been to a number of different posts uh, around our nation. Uh, this is a great place to serve, a great place to live. And a lot of that is because of the leadership of the people in this room. So thank you. Uh, to those of you who have made our lives uh, much, much better, and you really do that every day. Uh, so our, our service members, our civilians, our families, uh, we are very grateful for the many benefits uh, and the generous support from the businesses and government organizations that are here. So a little bit about the update. We're, we're still growing. So I'm about uh, 55,000 people on my orange barrel farm. If you visited Fort Meade lately, I'm growing orange barrels outside the base, and that's... Uh, Due to some hard work and very grateful for the state. So the State Highway Administration is the one that's making that hard work happen on 175 on the Annapolis Road. And that's going to become what used to be a little kind of two-lane road. It's going to be a six-lane road with a median and a hiker-biker lane on the side of it. And it's going to be awesome. It's going to happen within about a year and a half. And so we're very grateful for that. So that's happening off post. We're getting the work done on Rockenbach coming up on the north side. And then uh, just now we started the work with the money that we got from the 2016 National Defense Authorization Act to fix the gates on the eastern side of our post. We're going to expand those so I have greater inflow. You know, traffic's like water a little bit. They told me that in engineering school. And so we're doing that work now. So I'm very grateful for all the work from a lot of our elected representatives that helped to make that a reality so that we can do that work on the east side of our base. And that's happening now. We're using that now to fix those bases, or to fix those gates, excuse me. But I've got more growth coming, right? So I've got about 1,900 more uh, people being uh, posted, if you will, stationed at Fort Meade within the next four years or so. And that doesn't include family members. So you got to factor that in with a number of about two point something is, you know, how many humans are going to come. And that's the equivalent of about an army brigade being stationed at Fort Meade in the next four years. So in addition to that growth that's going on, I'm not getting any extra workforce to help support that from the garrison. In fact, they're decrementing my workforce in the garrison at the same time that they're increasing my workload. Uh, they call this making you stronger. And so we are the home to 118 different uh, partner organizations and units. And uh, just the chart over there, if you can't see it, I tried to show uh, very spatially just in between 
in that Baltimore, uh, the BC to DC corridor there, uh, we're grateful to have a lot of one-of-a-kind units right there at the hub at Fort Meade. So I've got, in addition to US Cyber Command, which uh, as the Senator noted, is likely to become a functional combatant command, which means it's the 10th such uh, you know, functional command or geographic combatant command-like organization in our, in our DOD inventory. Uh, also, the NSA, which has been there since 1952, Defense Information Systems Agency, Defense Media Activity, and about 114 other partner organizations. So I have a number of one-of-a-kind entities right there at Fort Meade, and that's not lost on anyone here, but that's a lot of special eggs in one basket. A lot of special eggs in one basket, one-of-a-kind things. The central adjudications facility for our nation that does all the uh, background checks, Fort Meade. So all those things are right there, right under our guys. So I've got, uh, I've got a good job, uh, keeps me busy. Uh, so as we're looking at that, we know that the key to our success is the ability to get to work. And I wrote on the slide down in there that we're, we're grateful for what we have, but we also know that uh, we are kind of a frontline fort. And what I mean by that is that I've been stationed in other units where you train at the post and then you deploy. You fly away to go do your job somewhere else. You, you get deployed forward to go do what you're doing, whether I was in Iraq or Afghanistan or Korea, anywhere. What I had to understand about Fort Meade, it took me a while because I'm a history guy, is that they're fighting from Fort Meade. So my service members, duty civilians, are coming onto post, going into secured facilities, and they are fighting. They're doing offensive cyber operations, cyber operations. They're doing defensive cyber operations. They're protecting your networks. They're protecting my networks. Uh, they're gathering intelligence, they're translating Farsi, they're translating Arabic uh, for 12 hours straight. So it's kind of a weird set for me to understand, but we're fighting from the post. So it's kind of a frontline fort. And what that means is that for me to fight, I have to deploy to the post, which means I have to get the traffic onto post in order to do that. You can't call it in because their work is done from a compartmented, you know, a secret facility. And so it became uh, inherent to me that the number one thing for me was not having a bunch of land maneuver ranges like I might have at Fort Knox or Fort Benning. It was getting all my workforce safely onto the post and safely off the post so I wasn't creating risk to mission or risk to force by not having that. And so we are blessed by our geography. So that's the great news. So on our chart there, I just threw out a few things that are just amazing about our, our camp. So. Fort Meade initially, Camp Meade, we were selected initially because of our railroads, our proximity to Delaware and to Pennsylvania and to Maryland, because that's where all the draftees initially came from World War I. And now we're uniquely located in our nation's premier cyber corridor. And so there's nothing like this in the rest of the world, really, if you look at the things around us. Uh, just down the road, we've got the National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, uh, just down the road to our west. We've got uh, Baltimore recently opened up the cyber range up to our north. 16, I think, of the uh, centers of academic e excellence are right here in Maryland. And then we have a dozen or more, I think, Fortune 500 top cyber businesses uh, right here in Maryland. We even had uh, drone racing championships up in Hagerstown recently. If you didn't pay attention to that, that's going to be the next big thing if you're not tracking it, because the government 100% is tracking drone racing. <laughs> Uh, so Maryland is continually advancing awareness of cyber jobs and holding conferences like the recent Cyber Maryland event uh, that happened just a couple weeks ago. So we are a frontline fort, uh, but I've got to get folks on post to do their jobs. And so I'm about halfway there. I've got the east side of the post. Thank you very much for the funding that we are authorized to enable those gates and those access control points to widen and expand and meet the needs of a growing population and growing workforce. But I'm not done. I've still got the west side of the post that needs to do the same thing in the interior corridor. So much like pumping a heart pumps blood, I've got to pump all that traffic in and out of the post in a safe manner uh, so I don't create that risk to force and risk to mission uh, that causes a national security problem. So looking a little bit at the future, um, in a previous job I had at United States uh, Special Operations Command, uh, I was the chief of plans. And so I did a lot of thinking about uh, global problem sets, a lot of thinking about future trends. And uh, that doesn't mean I have the answers. Uh, all my peers will tell you I don't. Um, but my thought is this, uh, my opinion, Fort Meade is as critical to national security in the 21st century as Fort Benning, uh, Naval Base Kitsibanger, Camp Pendleton, uh, Luke Air Force Base were to maneuver warfare in the 20th century. And I say that because this, the architecture of our nation, if you think about it in the past, was largely a function of the horse in the 18th century, then the railroad in the 19th century, automobile and the airplane in the 20th century. In this century, the computer and the automated activities, all those automated activities, have the potential to redefine our economy and redefine our national security posture. We are at the heart of that. There's no place like 
this region anywhere else in the world with a combination of one-of-a-kind elements, not just at Fort Meade, but the businesses in this sphere. And that's not something I'm making up, that's based on some hard research, and I think the smarter economists in this room are acutely aware of just what a special relationship and proximity that we have here. It doesn't exist uh, out in Santa Clara, it doesn't exist in Austin, it doesn't exist in China. It exists here, and I know that because I've had a global portfolio I've studied at some, at some length. So, to get there, the last point I want to make is that in terms of talent, we want to have a talent pipeline. Everyone wants to have the best talent for their business, right? Everyone's the same way. So Fort Meade has to attract the best talent to provide the best security for our nation. That's why I need it. We're already blessed with a vibrant region, offering a diverse array of lifestyles and activities. And for those service members and civilians with children, we must have excellent schools. And I think that we do have excellent schools. But I should be able to raise my hand and say that I've got the best cyber schools in the nation. I should be able to say that because I have the unusual, unique mixture of the best cyber units in the world stationed here at Meade. I've got outstanding education throughout the state of Maryland. And the connection of those two things, plus all the businesses interested in helping that grow, we've got the formula. We've got the formula right here. And so with that, I think that the top cyber units in DOD being right here and our children being right here, our children should be able to benefit from the unique gift found nowhere else in the nation. And the challenge for our schools on post sometimes, and they are awesome. I have awesome educators and great staff and I'm very grateful and I think Anne Arundel County does a superb job. Uh, my short story about that is this. Last year when I came, I was coming from Afghanistan. I didn't know anything about Fort Meade. I didn't know anything about the school. So my wife's doing the recon, you know, she's doing the look online. And unfortunately, when you look online, you get to Zillow and you get to Trulia and it's linked to great schools. And sometimes your great schools don't look so great, but they might be great schools in another way. So we said, well, we don't know. We'll put her in a private school. So we did. So we had her in a private school last year. And the more I unpeeled the onion and I looked at the schools on post, I found out that they were doing awesome things. That the middle school is there, because she's a middle school child, they have an IB program that feeds into the high school IB program, and that they do amazing things there. I just had to peel it back and find out. And so we talked about it, and uh, so I put my only child in MacArthur Middle School this year. And she's doing a great job there, and she's loving it. <laughs> and I'm not doing that to say that I'm doing that for anything. That's my, that's my only child. So I told the principal, I said, hey, Eugene, don't screw this up. Uh, <laughs> Principal Whiting's awesome. He really is. But I say that only because, very objectively, I took a look at all the different places I could do it, and I had the, the wherewithal to put her anywhere I wanted to. But I honestly believe that the program there is exactly right for what we wanted to do. And so the, the, the energy's there. The energy is 100% there, and I think that you've got great educators there in Anne Arundel County and all the counties. I'm just no Anne Arundel better than the others. And so I think it's there. The challenge sometimes for our schools is that uh, I don't have super wealthy parents uh, in the region to help support some of the cyber-related programs and after-school activities. And so I believe that with consistent help from our business partners and the synergy created from our military cyber units, and they have volunteered. I've got cyber units lashed up now with the middle schools, and there's already existing programs between the NSA and Department of Homeland Security with the high school, and I've got cyber units raising their hands to come merge with the high school as well. With all that synergy, this region could absolutely become a dynasty of cyber talent production for the years to come. So I'm honored to have the privilege of sharing the stage with our elected leaders and uh, grateful for the opportunity to address you today. Um, Fort Meade has enjoyed a superb 100th anniversary. We like to say that from saddles to cyberspace, we are the nation's platform for information, intelligence, and cyber operations. And so thank you uh, again for the opportunity to talk to you here today, and thank you for your kind attention. Uh, and just so everyone knows, uh, I'll make sure that uh, all the slides that we covered today are on the website. So if you're tucked away in the back there and are having uh, a little bit of a hard time seeing the uh, information, we'll make sure that, that you get it. Um, I also want to let you all know that cheesecake is coming out. Um, and if you're not a cheesecake fan, please leave a slice for me because I think I can eat three or four of them. So uh, enjoy your cheesecake. Um, uh, you know, the, the great thing about an event like this, and you know, I don't want to be a broken record, Record, is that um, it positions all of you so you can be proactive, right? Well, we want to make sure that you're
you're not being reactive when you know there's a bad trend out there and we're already down that cycle uh, that we're moving and positioning ourselves based on that. You know, we want to get information out early up in front, uh, we want you to get uh, good information uh, that you can uh, act on. And that's why um, we have our next keynote speaker. Um, I am thrilled to introduce Dr. J.D. Foster. He is a senior vice president of the Economic Policy Division and Chief Economist at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. He explores and, and explains developments in the U.S. and global economies. He also participates in discussions around the country regarding the economy and economic policy and supports other functions at the Chamber with economic analysis and guidance. Prior to joining the U.S. Chamber of Commerce in June of 2013, Dr. Foster was the Norman B. Tour Senior Fellow in the Economics of Fiscal Policy at the Heritage Foundation. Before coming to Heritage in 2007, Dr. Foster spent five years as the Associate Director for Economic Policy at the Office of Management and Budget, OMB. In 2001, Dr. Foster served as economic counsel in the Office of Tax Policy at the U.S. Department of the Treasury. Prior to that, he served as legislative director to Representative Crane of Illinois, vice chairman of the Committee of, on Ways and Means in the U.S. House of Representatives. From 1993, in 1999, Dr. Foster was executive director and chief economist of the Tax Foundation, one of the nation's oldest and most respected nonprofit research organizations. And before that, he was chief of staff at the White House Council of Economic Advisors under Dr. Michael Boskin. Dr. Foster received a BA in economics and a BA in mathematics from the University of Colorado an MA in economics from Brown University, and a PhD in economics from Georgetown University. We have a lot of Georgetown and Harvard representation uh, here today with our speakers. Uh, so please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker, Dr. J.D. Foster. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I have had the privilege in my career of following on many speakers. I've never had the privilege of following on someone who got the combat infantry badge. Uh, that is a distinct honor on my part. Many of you may not know, I just learned the other day, uh, General George S. Patton never got the CIB. That's how special it is, so sir, thank you. Uh, I'm from the US Chamber of Commerce. Uh, you may not know the Chamber of Commerce is primarily a federal organization. We were chartered by the state chambers to focus on the federal government. Uh, Subnote uh, to that is leave the states alone, that's our territory, which we have done ever since. Uh, we partner very closely with state and local chambers, but it is a partnership, and we are proud to be able to work with the Central Maryland uh, Chamber. If you're a member of the chamber, uh, the local chamber, thank you very much. If you're not, think about joining. Uh, the local chambers play tremendous roles in local business community and in your lo local communities in general uh, as a source of strength, a support, a resource, um, they deserve your support, and I hope you will consider it if you're not already a member. Uh, Raj, if I get going along too much and start messing with your timeline, just give me a two minute warning at the appropriate time. All right, so we're gonna talk about the economic outlook, and I found over the years that the best way to talk about the economic outlook is to start by talking about Sir Isaac Newton. Okay, anyone see that coming? Now, you know, with all the politicians in the room, I thought I'd get at least one hand up on that. Uh, sorry, guys, we, love, we kid because we love, right? Now, Sir Isaac Newton is relevant in the following respect. He's the greatest physicist of all time, and he, uh, as many physicists do, liked to distill his understandings into simple laws, sometimes mathematically expressed. The first law that Newton came up with uh, was a very simple one, one version of which goes, things in motion tend to stay in motion, things at rest tend to stay in bed. That, of course, is the teenager version of Newton's first law. Uh, but the, first, the key principle here that we need to understand is things in motion tend to stay in motion unless acted upon by some other force. 
They tend to stay in motion in the same direction at the same speed. And that's basically the way the economy wants to work. You will see as we're getting along in this uh, expansion as the years go by, you're going to get commentary, people talking about, well, the economy is getting tired. It's been growing for a very long time. We're running out of energy. Probably going to expect a recession just because we run out of gas. Well, if you talk to your local businesses, you don't see them saying, I need a recession, I'm tired. Yeah. That's not the way it works. The natural inclination of the economy is not only to continue, but to continue to grow. Because the workforce grows, the workforce acquires more skills, more capital is employed, businesses starting up, buying more, business, more uh, equipment, capital, business equipment of various forms, technologies advancing, which means we produce the same things better and we produce new things that are better. That's the nature of an expansion, is for it to just continue to grow and to expand uh, until it's acted upon by some other force. And that other force sometimes is natural in nature, uh, natural disasters. Puerto Rico is a, unfortunately a great example of this right now. But more often than not, we end up with slowdowns or recessions because policymakers made either a really bad mistake or a series of bad mistakes that disrupted the natural flow of the economy enough to slow it down. Um, in history, in our history, uh, if you go back to the Great Depression, economists always like to go back to the Great Depression because it teaches so many great lessons. One of them is we had a tremendously protectionist policy, which the rest of the world then quickly followed, and a monetary policy that was exactly wrong. And it produced the Great Depression. Two policy areas, either one of which would have been problematic, you put them together, you have the Great Depression. In the Jimmy Carter uh, era, um, we had a series of policies, regulatory tax and other, which debilitated the economy, zapped it of its uh, strength, and then a inflationary monetary policy, which then had to be wrung out of the economy at the beginning of the Reagan administration, a series of policy mistakes leading to a very slow economy, ultimately leading to the next deepest recession in the modern era. The most recent recession, again, was a result of policy mistakes, but they were a little more subtle. These were regulatory policy mistakes, primarily, over a wide range of industries, from credit rating, banking, and housing, and some housing markets much more than others, and not just in the United States, but globally. This was a global regulatory breakdown, and it wasn't a matter of too much regulation or too little. We were, the United States was accused, along with the UK, of having too little financial regulation. The Europeans were very proud that they regulated a lot more, and they had suffered from the exact same issues that we did, because it wasn't a matter of small, more or less, it was a matter of smarter or dumber. We were all in the dumber category. We had regulations that were perfectly designed for a financial system in the 1950s or 60s. We were operating in 2007 and 8. The mistakes that were then shown as one mistake sort of as it manifested fed into the next ended up with the Great Recession. The point is the economy wants to continue to grow. That's its very nature and that's the Newtonian nature of the economy. And it's usually when Washington uh, or other governments around the world um, really make big mistakes, not small ones. Small ones we can all live with, we adjust to. That's sort of normal. The big ones. The really big ones are the ones where you collect a whole bunch of small ones together, as in the recent recession. That's how you get a slowdown. Well, right now, there is no sign of a slowdown. The good news is the economic outlook is really pretty good. Uh, we are getting uh, toward the end. We have now have the third longest expansion in the post-war era. By April, we'll have the second longest expansion in the post-war era. And surprisingly, despite it being so long, all those folks who like to think that, well, when the economy is growing for this period of time, it's going to get tired and slow down. No, it's accelerating. The second quarter, we grew at 3.1%. The third quarter, first read is 3%. Um, I think that 3% might not be really as strong as the 31 but the fact is that's a significant acceleration over the previous year where we were below 2%. Percentage points here really matter. The difference between 2 and 3 is not 1%, it's 50%. That's really growing rapidly. Now, how long we can continue to that is to be seen. It depends on what Washington does. What we know is why we accelerated. It's the same reason we know why the economy performed so poorly throughout the recent period. 
it's because we had a government in Washington that had a high regulatory agenda, a very severe regulatory agenda on a wide range of issues where the trade-off was we're going to regulate more at the expense of a little bit of growth. The economy continued to grow, but we never had the surge of growth that you normally expect after a deep recession. We just muddled along, and everybody would talk, use the exact same language. Bernie Sanders, in the recent campaign, talked about how the economy was leaving so many people behind. Hillary Clinton used the exact same language. Barack Obama used the exact same language. Not surprisingly, everyone on the Republican side used the exact same language, because that's those were the facts. The economy was not performing as it should, and a lot of people were not doing as well as they should, and the reason is very simple. We had a president, President Obama, who had a very powerful regulatory agenda. Now, what happened? What changed? Well, the simple thing that happened is President Trump said no more. He said, we're going to stop the regulatory onslaught of American businesses. We're going to repeal as many of the regulations as we can uh, that were passed through, and then we'll start to rewriting them. It wasn't the specific regulations. It was the change of the environment that made the difference. Now, economists will deb debate whether or not the recent acceleration in the economy is because of President Trump or not. Economists can debate anything, as you know, so we'll continue to do that. What is unde undeniable is the stock market is now up 25%. And the increase, which that's a massive increase, the increase dates to Election Day. So if you, if you're going to have a tough time arguing that that cannot be attributed to President Trump. And if that's true, then the growth effects probably might be as well. But that's all he did. He took the regulatory foot off the brake of the economy. He hasn't done a lot else that really accelerated. And just um, in case anyone thinks this is an anti-Barack Obama diatribe, which uh, it most certainly is not, I want to point out that President Obama also had a very powerful pro-growth policy in one respect. His trade agenda was powerfully pro-growth. The Trans-Pacific Partnership and the agreements he tried to negotiate with Europe never made it cross, across the line, but it wasn't because he didn't try. He spent a lot of political capital and took a lot of political heat on what would have been a powerfully pro-growth policy. It didn't succeed, so we didn't get the benefits of that. And unfortunately, both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump campaigned on not signing TPP and killing it, and that's what happened. But the President Obama certainly did try. So here we are. The economy is cruising along, no recession in sight, and we're now at the third to last chapter of the normal operation of the economy. And that third to last chapter is getting back to full employment. After all of these years, we're still not back to full employment. Now, the unemployment rate's been below, at or below 5% now for over two years. And traditionally, economists would have said, well, that means you're at full employment. But what we've learned is labor markets have changed. And the usual metrics of what you mean by full employment have changed. 5% unemployment rate does not tell you you're at full employment. Just ask the millions of Americans who'd like to be working or working full time and can't. So we're not at full employment yet. You can quantify this fairly simply. Last year, we were, had about 180,000 jobs a month created in the economy. Pretty good pace. Not spectacular, but pretty good pace. When we're at full employment, that number will dip to between 90 and 100,000. That will mat means we're creating jobs at the same rate at which the labor force is expanding. When those two things are happening, and there's nothing else bad going on in the economy, it seems like we're just continuing to rolling along, that means you're at full employment. So we're creating too many jobs relative to the growth of the labor force to be at full employment yet. I think that'll probably come about sometime next year. So that'll complete the third chapter of the recovery. The penultimate chapter of the recovery uh, will then be in wages. Wages have stagnated through much of the recovery period. First four years, they didn't grow at all. Then they grew slowly for the next few years. Again, I'm not observing anything that every national politician in the country hasn't observed. We all know that this is the case, that on, on a national basis, real wages were stagnating and then not growing. And in large part, it's because we had so much excess employment, so many people looking for jobs. Well, once you get to full employment, labor markets start to get really tight. That's when you're going to start to see real wage growth. And that's going to be great for households, going to be great for families. Great for building further the foundation of our economy, making it stronger and able to resist whatever comes down the pike from Washington or otherwise. We're going to start to see that real substantial growth in wages. Now, we have heard for the last few years 
businesses complain from one side of the country to the other, I've got all of these jobs to fill. I can't find people to fill them. And it would be distilled down to the expression, I have workers without jobs and jobs without workers. And it was absolutely true. And part of it was people were stuck in homes where they were underwater and they couldn't move to the jobs. Part of it is that technology advanced and left some folks in the workforce behind. A lot of explanations. Don't look for just one. But it was true for many years. It's now changing. It's ch changing in the following respect. Employers who've said, I can't find the workers I need, used to be a period. Now it's, I can't find the workers I need at the wages I expect to pay. Because you even haven't had to pay much in additional wages for most businesses across the country. And now with that tight labor market, you're going to have to. And not just for the new people, you're going to have to pay a lot more in higher wages and benefits to the people that you're trying to keep. Because if you don't, somebody else will steal them from you. There's going to be a lot of worker migration between firms for a while as those who haven't got the joke yet that wages are rising, they didn't get the joke yet, they're going to lose the workforce very quickly. So we're going to see the wages rising and businesses are frankly not always going to want to be paying a lot more, but that's what's going to have to happen for them to keep the workforce and have the workforce they need. That's the second chapter. Third chapter from the end, full employment. Second chapter from the end, finally, a significant rise in real wages. In the last chapter, this is a kind of a surprising one. The last chapter here is that as those wages are rising, a lot of firms that have been able to get along pretty well because they didn't have a lot of wage pressure, they weren't all that efficient, they weren't all that productive, but they could survive and, and, and do okay. Once wages start to rise much more rapidly than their top line receipts, there's gonna be a spike in business failures. And of course, the press is gonna report this as disastrous for the economy, business failures are rising, this is a sign of economic weakness, which is all a lot of hogwash. This is a sign of economic strength. In order for the economy to grow, we have to release resources from the people who are less productive, less efficient in using them, particularly our workforce, to the employers who can use them more efficiently. It's the Schumpeter constructive destructionism, right? So you're gonna see the spike in business failures, and at the same time, you're gonna see a spike in business startups. That will be the last chapter of the recovery, and that's when we're really gonna be rolling along. So the good news is the economy is doing all right. It's going to accelerate. We've got some more changes, and they're going to be hard to interpret. Uh, but uh, I think they'll be all right. Let me mention now, as I said, the economy tends to go along on a Newtonian basis until Washington really messes something up. At the beginning of the year, I raised to the board of the U.S. Chamber the three things that I thought Washington had the greatest possibility of really messing up. The first one was... Janet Yellen, the chair of the Federal Reserve, was going to be stepping down at the beginning of 2018. We have had bad chairmen of Federal Reserve boards in the past. The results are disastrous. So if President Trump nominated someone for that position and they actually got through, we would be in real trouble in the stock market and financial markets would figure that out very quickly and reflect that in, in market values. That was a grave concern and a state of concern for a long time because there was very little reliable coming out of the Trump White House on this subject. Well, we finally got a list, a sense of who the top four or top two are, and none of the people that I was particularly worried about are on that list. There's some folks we like more than others, perhaps, but they all seem to be within the range of folks who know what they're doing, and if they were the chairman of the Federal Reserve or the vice chairman of the Federal Reserve, that they would be all right, and, and that threat is... is um, dissipated some. So as long as in the next couple of weeks, as we expect, Chairman, uh, President Trump names Janet Yellen's successor, and it's one of these people, that's a risk that we don't have to run anymore. Uh, another risk that we've had to run has to do with the debt limit. And the Senator uh, mentioned earlier that, um, you know, our fiscal situation is not very good. Uh, we ran into the debt limit earlier in the year. Congress extended it to uh, December. We'll actually probably have to deal with it next year. So for 2017, the debt limit's not an issue. It's going to be a big problem again in 2018. Something about this you need to understand. We will hear about budget fights and Congress passing a budget. If Congress passes a budget, that's great. That's Congress's way of saying, this is what we intend to do for the rest of this fiscal year on fiscal policy. If they don't pass a budget, that's bad form. Nothing more. Bad form. 
Then we have appropriations bills. Senator mentioned the appropriations process, continuing resolution. If in December, when the current continuing resolution expires, they don't pass another spending bill in time, that's going to create a, quote, government shutdown. Well, it doesn't really shut the government down, does it? It shuts down a few positions in the government. It lasts a few days. We've gone through this enough to know that's bad form. It's really unhelpful if you're involved as, uh, directly with that. The colonel will have new kinds of problems to manage. But it's not a big shock to the economy. On the other hand, we don't raise a debt limit in time and have a true debt crisis, which my guess will probably come about sometime uh, in uh, late March. Could be a little bit later, depending on timing. We don't really know at this point. We don't raise the debt limit in time, and we default on the debt, which is technically at least what would happen and may happen, in fact, if they don't prioritize payments on interest. You don't raise the debt limit on time, and that, what, the, what does that mean? It means, first of all, the government now really has a balanced budget because they just slashed spending on an annualized rate about $800 billion. But most importantly, it means default. U.S. Treasury securities underlie the entire global financial system. The Treasury bond is the bedrock of the global financial system. If that's no longer a valid instrument because the U.S. government is technically in default, I can't finish the sentence. We've never done this before. We don't really know. But the simple thought of it scares the heck out of every economist and financial analyst in the country. That's a risk we dare not run. Not an issue for 2017 will be an issue again in 2018. We're hoping at the chamber we can convince the Congress to set this problem aside once and for all. The debt limit was put in place to give Congress one last bite of the apple, one sure shot every year to correct fiscal policy and the amount of uh, debt and deficits we're running. That's the idea. And for a while, it kind of worked. It hasn't worked for decades. All it is now is a concocted show. All it is now is an opportunity for some folks to get up and make big speeches knowing all along that they need to raise the debt limit at the end of the day. If that were it, okay, fine. We've, we've seen these kinds of shows in Washington before. The difference is they're playing chicken. And as a matter of probability, someday they're not going to get off the rails in time. Someday someone's going to miscalculate, and they're not going to raise the debt limit, and Treasury will default, and then we will see exactly how much of a catastrophe that, catastrophe that wreaks on the U.S. economy and the global economy. That's still a very deep risk. And then the third risk that, that I mentioned to the board and is the, for this year the biggest risk we face coming out of Washington has to do with trade. In particular, the North American Free Trade Agreement and U.S.-Korea trade agreements. President Trump was pretty clear during the campaign how he feels about international trade agreements. He didn't like them much. He tried to explain that he favors free trade, but it's got to be fair trade. I've yet to meet a politician who couldn't agree with that. How we interpret those words is a little bit different from point to point. The president has threatened to simply withdraw from NAFTA. He did that early in his, his term. We made the point that that would be disastrous. He backed off a little bit. Language out of the administration was much more benign for many months. More recently, he and his negotiating team have put the hardest, hard, playing the hardest ball that you can play. They're fighting for the toughest deal that they can fight with Canada and Mexico, our largest trading partners. We are sincerely worried that he's just going to withdraw. And guess what, folks? The president does, in fact, according to the law, have the authority unilaterally on his own because of what he had for breakfast that day to withdraw from NAFTA. Nobody can stop him. We will, of course, have to, and many others will take him to court. Prospects aren't real good because law is pretty plain. When, when you withdraw, you still have a time period before legally the agreement uh, comes to an end. But this is a big deal. And it's not just a big deal for NAFTA with our two biggest trading partners, but the signal this would send to the global economy about U.S. leadership on international trade would be devastating. And then you have the Korean agreement, not nearly as important in terms of economics. Our trade with Korea, South Korea obviously is very important, but Mexico and Canada are our big trading partners. The Korean Peninsula right now is a little bit of a dicey place, as you may have noticed. We have a president in North Korea who likes, wants to build a, a hydrogen bomb. In fact, he's threatening to have an atmospheric test of a hydrogen bomb any day soon. And he wants to build a ballistic missile, and he's been pretty good at building ballistic missiles of late. And the intelligence community suggests that he's figured out how to miniaturize that hydrogen bomb and put it on said ballistic missile and can reach us. This is a bit of a problem for us, just to put it mildly. 
Who's our number one ally in the region? That would be South Korea. Who are we threatening to withdraw a trade agreement from? That would be South Korea. The shock that this would send, not just in the economic side, the free trade side, but the shock that this would send throughout the region of Asia and the entire global trading system that we would withdraw from a new agreement. The agreement with Korea is relatively new. The agreement with NAFTA is older. We can modernize that. It can be improved. And we were working with the administration to improve it. The Korean agreement is relatively new. There's not a lot of improvement that can be made. And here we are threatening to withdraw an agreement with our number one ally in the region where we are trying to contain a man who wants to build a nuclear bomb that he can threaten us with explicitly. Other countries have nuclear weapons. Nobody else is explicitly threatening us with them at this moment. So this is a really big deal. Uh, if we can navigate that last big threat, if we can keep uh, the president uh, focused on other issues, on improving NAFTA, on not withdrawing from South Korea, we'll be in much better shape. It's not just all negatives. There are some positive things that we can do. Senator Van Hollen mentioned the importance of an infrastructure bill. We completely agree. And the problem we have as a nation is we have different conceptions of what infrastructure bills should look like and who should pay for them. And we haven't resolved them for over a decade. And we still don't have a resolution. So we're going to continue to work for infrastructure. We're going to continue to work on taking the foot off the regulatory break. But by far, the number one issue that can advance the economy going forward is tax reform. It's tax reform. If you ref Our tax system is so embedded in economic decision making, especially among businesses, and distorting those decisions as to how much to invest and where to invest, at home or abroad, different locations, different industries. It's so distortionary that we apply our resources less efficiently. We get less production for them. Every other country in the world has figured this out and has consistently reduced their tax rates on businesses while we have not. So we now have the highest business tax rates in the world. Every other country has adopted an internationally competitive tax system. We're still operating on a tax system designed in the 50s. It's a miracle our companies can compete at all in the international environment with these, this kind of a, uh, a handicap. Tax reform can address that. And the, the two pillars of tax reform, to be very clear, one is a middle class tax cut, because that's what the president insisted on. And the middle class has not done very well in recent years in general. So you can understand that motivation. And the second is business tax reform to allow the economy to grow more rapidly. If you were to quantify the benefits of every other thing we might do right in, in federal policy, you might begin to approach the gains you can get from tax reform. Everything else is marginal compared to what you can get from tax reform. Uh, I want to address a couple issues the Senator mentioned. Um, one of them a bit of a bugaboo and the other one uh, something of a misunderstanding. The bugaboo is uh, that the budget resolution that recently passed in the House and the Senate that makes tax reform possible uh, cites one and a half trillion dollars of tax relief. Now, he, as the Senator mentioned, the Congressional Budget Office is charged with keeping track of these sorts of numbers, and they are a very professional outfit. Uh, we all have our bones to pick with CBO from time to time, but they're not independent. They're not independent in the sense that they have to operate according to the rules past Congresses set for them, and the precedents past Congresses set for them. Two rules in particular are relevant here. The first is CBO is required to figure out what revenues are going to be going forward based off of current law. So for example, if you have a tax provision that lowers people's taxes and it expires, CBO has to assume expiration. Well, there are about $400 billion worth of tax provisions in the current code that expire in the next few years that CBO assumes will expire. That is, they're assuming $400 billion of tax hikes. Almost all of those provisions are things that will absolutely be extended, especially the number one, about 240 billion of that is bonus depreciation for plant and equipment. Tax reform is about expensing, that's 100% deduction for plant and equipment. This provision is 50%, so it's subsumed. The point is that $400 billion is phony. Now CBO is doing what it's required to do, but this is Washington phony math. The real number is actually about 1.1. Now, this is about economic growth. If you get economic, additional economic growth, you're going to get dynamic feedback revenue. People have more income. They're going to pay more tax. That reduces the cost. OK, so what do you need? Well, according to tables that were in President Obama's last budget, 
You need between two to three percentage points of additional economic growth over 10 years, and that entire $1.1 trillion disappears. So for all intents and purposes, this is a revenue neutral tax reform. So it's not a budget buster. If it was, we would be very concerned. We ran a budget deficit last year of $700 billion. Those are the policies left behind by President Obama after he'd already doubled the national debt. And over the next 10 years, that number rises to $1.4 trillion under current policies and no recessions. So we're already in a situation which is fiscally unsustainable. If we had a major tax reform that added to that picture, worsened that picture, it wouldn't be sustainable. We would all understand. Every business in America would say, at some point, they're going to have to raise taxes again. If it's not permanent, it's not going to work for pro-growth. So if it was a big budget buster, we wouldn't be supportive of it because we want permanent tax reform because only permanent reform can make it really grow. The other issue um, is the state and local tax deduction and the home mortgage deduction. The framework that was announced said we will absolutely not touch the home mortgage interest deduction. It's as simple as that. And the reason for that is every time someone's tried to touch it in the past, they got their hands burned. And there was just no need for that. Uh, they have talked about limiting the, uh, uh, limiting the state and local tax deduction. So that would be, in, in this case as it, as it is now, everything but the property tax. The property tax, for the moment, seems to be safe. All the others are not at issue. Now, if you're a, a relatively high tax state like Maryland, you're saying, ah, I got a big problem here for my itemized, itemizing tax payers. Except they've also said explicitly they're going to double the standard deduction. So for the vast majority of current itemizers, they're not going to be itemizing anymore. That alone eliminates the issue from the vast majority of taxpayers in Maryland whether or not you get to deduct property taxes or not. Almost everybody who currently itemizes, not everybody, but almost everybody, is not going to be taking the standard deduction. And you don't care about the home mortgage deduction anymore. You don't care whether income taxes are deductible or not, or property or taxes are deductible or not, because the totality of your deductions doesn't get you above that 5%. So tax reform is, is going to be a tough fight, and some folks are going to face higher taxes. And some businesses are going to face higher taxes, and a large percentage of the business community is not going to be very happy about this, but the majority we think will be, because this can really make the economy grow. Uh, let me uh, conclude with uh, something that you all might remember. Um, I'm going to do a variation on it. Uh, one of my favorite movies is The Best Spirit and the Best Workers in the World. Why, by God, if we can get tax reform done right, I actually pity these poor foreign buzzards we're going up against. I really do. I think he's right. If we can get tax reform done, the US, currently rated as number two in the World Economic Forum and competitiveness, will clearly be number one. American workers will benefit, and American businesses will benefit, and our economy will be a lot stronger for a long time. Thank you. Minutes. Uh... 25 minutes of our program, and at this time, i actually like to call up our three panelists, uh, Julie, um, Mark, and David, if you could come up here and grab a seat. Um, the last part of our program is going to be an economic development panel, and so uh, Dr. Foster gave you a great overview of what we can expect on the federal level, um, and now we're going to go down into the weeds a bit here, and um, as all of you know, we cover uh, three jurisdictions here in the Central Maryland Chamber, uh, so our businesses primarily, I mean, we have some that are outside of these three areas, but our businesses primarily are in Anne Arundel County, Howard County, and uh, Prince George's County, and before we dive into uh, the, the panel, uh, and I'll be moderating the panel, we're going to give um, each of our panelists two or three minutes just to talk about their jurisdiction and their offices. And when we say two or three minutes, they know I got my you know, crane over here. I'm going to pull them. Um, so uh, first, since we're going alphabetically, I will call up uh, Julie Musog from uh, the Anne Arundel County Economic Development uh, Corporation. She is the CEO and president. Uh, because of our limit on time, I'm not going to go over our panelists' bios, but they they are in your program, so um, you know, I encourage you to uh, take a look. Um, but now I'm going to hand the uh, clicker. Good afternoon. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I'm going to walk through these slides very quickly since I do know that the sitting for two plus hours is a long time. So Anne Arundel County, let me get to this. 
Um, just an overview of our demographics, we have a population of almost uh, 600,000, unemployment rate about 3.5%, median household income at almost $90,000. Our property tax rate is 91.5 cents, and our personal income tax rate is 2.5%. We have just over 55,000 businesses in the county. 15,000 of those have more than one employee, and the other 40,000 are sole proprietorships. Oops. We continue to see tremendous growth in the western part of the county. A couple examples of this are obviously Fort Meade and NSA. This is Maryland's largest employer with over 56,000 employees. The East Campus development has 13 ongoing projects with more than $2 billion in ongoing facility construction right now. Arundel Mills and Arundel Preserve are also continue to show tremendous growth and um, change. The Live Hotel and Conference Center will be opening up this spring. That will be a 4,000 seat conference center. The Arundel Luxury Apartment Building just opened recently with 233 units in a 15-story tower. BWI also continues to show incredible growth in both cargo and passenger traffic with 60 million new expansion um, coming up in construction and another six additional international gates. As far as residential development, we continue to see strength in the multifamily market a majority of these developments are in the west, um, western part of the county as well. There are five separate uh, apartment and townhome projects right now. The Point in Odenton, the Arundel, Broadstone, Alexan Concord, and Shannon's Glen. Each of these projects ranges from somewhere between 200 to almost 400 apartment units. An ongoing project that will probably be going on for almost a decade is out in Two Rivers. That's a 2,000 uh, home, uh, 2,000 home development, and it's a mixture of age-restricted and unage-restricted. That's also located in Odenton. And coming soon, the flats at Academy Yard Phase 2 will be starting and will add additional retail and more multifamily in Odenton. We can continue to also see strength and strong demand for industrial and warehouse space in the market. Brandon Woods 3 broke ground this summer. And we believe the first building will be completed late spring to early summer of 2017. But when fully built out, this will be almost a million square feet of warehouse space. All right, if I'm um, doing this correctly and going alphabetically, I believe we now have uh, Mark Thompson, Vice President of Business Development for the Howard County Development Authority. Thank you, Raj, uh, and thank you, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, and I want to again echo congratulations to Raj. Raj and I worked together for uh, a good period of time at Howard County Government, and I can assure you all, you're in very good hands. So. Um, with that, let's talk a little bit about some, some trends in Howard County. This first slide shows you our employment trajectory. Um, and you can see we currently stand, this is the latest data we have, at about 167,690 jobs. That's a, a, an 11,733 job increase over the last four years, which uh, is about a 7.5% gain. So very positive job growth in Howard County, and that's something we're very um, bullish on and continue to see given the levels of interest and activity that our team is involved in. Um, going to move on to, so, so what is all that job growth? What, what's the composition of our local economy? And you can see we're really focused, uh, while we have a lot of diversity in, in Howard County's economy, we have three really strong players, professional and business services, that's something that everybody's familiar with Howard County, given our, our outstanding levels of education, second highest median income in the country. Um, but, but the others are, are just as important and vital. Um, these three top, top three categories, professional and business services, trade, transportation, um, account for, and education and health services account for about 65% of our total economic composition. And, 
we really have one of the most dominant um, uh, areas of food distribution, food production along the Route 1 corridor, and I know may, many of you are involved in that business, but with the Maryland Food Center Authority anchoring that, um, it's, a, it's a big piece of our second largest component of our local economy. With that, what you end up seeing with that powerful economy is, is one of the lowest unemployment rates in the state, significantly lower than the, the, uh, the United States. And we continue to rank typically first or tied for first with, uh, in terms of unemployment. So one of the key challenges that our team faces um, and, and working with our colleagues at the state and, and workforce development, hi Fran, um, is, is the war for talent. And uh, with the Howard Community College, we're also very engaged with them. But um, that's something that we, we continue to be laser focused on. Um, and I will end up, get this thing to go, with what's going on in the real estate market. How do all those positive, strong economic trends translate to the street? Well, you can see across sectors, we've got rate, vacancy rates that are lower than they were the previous year. As well, we've got sub 10% vacancy rates, so very strong property fundamentals. Unlike many of, of the areas that um, in, in other counties in Maryland and especially in Northern Virginia, where you've got these immense office overhangs given the retreat from the federal government, um, we're enjoying some very positive trends, and in fact, we'll discuss in a little bit some of the new projects that are, that are going on with that. So with that, I'm going to turn it over. Thank you very much. And our final jurisdiction, uh, we now have, and uh, I, I didn't mention this before, but uh, uh, David Lewis, who is actually the Director of Economic Development uh, for the Prince George's Economic Development Corporation, graciously stepped in. Um, uh, the CEO uh, had to be called away, and uh, I'm glad that you're able to uh, tell us a little bit about the Prince George's County uh, EDC. Good afternoon. The, the uh, photograph you see there, that's that National Harbor at the southern end of Prince George's County on the Potomac River. And that statue is called the Awakening. You may have known it. It, it used to be in D.C. Um, and then it was moved to National Harbor. It's a 300-acre development. Uh, you have a Gaylord Hotel and, and Resort. And also, this is where the new $1.4 billion MGM Casino and Resort opened uh, in December last year. Okay. So just by proximity to the, to the nation's capital, that's an advantage for us. Also, the stable business environment, the county has a AAA bond rating and I think it's 2% of the counties in the U.S. have that distinction. And we're also in a state that has a AAA bond rating. There are eight states in the U.S. with that distinction. So we, we find ourselves in an in a exclusive club. For the last three quarters, Prince George's County has led the state of Maryland in job growth, had 11,000 net new jobs added to, added to the tax rolls. There are 14 federal agencies in the county, and even today, we're adding uh, a 15th. There's a groundbreaking this afternoon at the, um, at the Branch Avenue Metro Station, and it, that will bring 3,700 em employees to that site. It's a 575,000 square foot development. And then we have another federal agency looking to move into Prince George's, and we're in in the early stages of that negotiation. Also in the county, <clears throat> when the FBI was looking to relocate and consolidate headquarters, we have two of the three sites that made the short list. Now that project has stalled for now, but we believe when it gets started again, those sites will come back in, in, into vogue. The, one of the sites is also one that we pitched for the Amazon HQ2, 8 million square foot facility with 
50,000 net new jobs. The county is growing. We're at 900,000 residents. The medium household income is at 77,000, which is 20,000 above uh, the U.S. Um, medium household income. We have seven colleges and universities. And we'll point out here this program, Youth Career Connect, that was uh, funded by a $7 million grant from the U.S. Department of Labor. And this is to help develop that pipeline of a workforce starting in the high school years from ninth grade. And this is focusing on STEM and the hospitality industry. 30% of our residents have a bachelor's degree. Again, going back to location, being right on the doorstep of, of DC, but also positioned between the greater Baltimore region. So if you take the, the population of greater Washington and greater Baltimore, it's 10 million, a population of 10 million. And what links us is specifically with, very well with the Washington region is the metro stations. So we have 15, which is the most metro stations outside of Washington, D.C. And we're adding the uh, $2 million construction project for the Purple Line light rail system. And that broke ground just recently. Access to three international airports. Most regions around the country will have one, maybe two, but not three. So what's happened in Prince George's County over the last the last seven, seven years. The new county executive came in, Rashern L. Baker III, and the first thing he did was establish an, an, an ethics office. This is to bring integrity to the county. He streamlined the permitting process. Before Mr. Baker started his term, a business getting a permit had to go to five different offices. It really had to navigate the system. Now you have more accountability. There's one agency Department of Permitting, Inspection, and Enforcement. He's launched uh, this neighborhood, it's called the Transforming Neighborhood Initiatives. So if parts of the county are really doing well and other parts are really doing badly, that's not good overall. This TNI program identified the six most difficult, struggling uh, communities in the county and targeted all the resources of county government to help address issues from education to child care, uh, et cetera. So far, two of, the, two of the initial six have graduated. And when they graduate, that means they've met a threshold and it doesn't end, but it's turned over to a local citizenry group that continues the process. We have a $50 million economic development incentive fund if you're familiar with the Department of Commerce's meet out program, this is very similar. And in that program, we still have $17 million to invest. Our schools are improving. And with that, what we call this is op call this activate prosperity. And that's really getting the energy into the, the business community and getting the resources out of our office and into the hands of businesses at the right time. I have an information packet and over here on our table, Nichelle Holmes, if you like, could you please stand, please? Yeah, if you'd like a copy, please see her. Thank you. All right, so we're gonna run the fastest economic development panel in Maryland's history. We're gonna make the most of the next 12 minutes, but uh, I promise you will all get out uh, in time. And uh, because I've cheated you out of networking, you are more than welcome to stay uh, after this event. In fact, encouraged uh, to stick around the network um, uh, a little bit. Uh, but again, we want to cram in as much information for you and your business as possible. Uh, that being said, I wanna dive into this. Uh, what we're gonna do, um, I have about three or four questions. We'll see what we can get through here. Um, and we're just gonna systematically uh, kind of go down the line. And um, the first question I have here is, the Central Maryland Chamber has many developers, construction firms, planning firms, and architecture firms. As a result, 
we want to know what are some of the major new or upcoming developments and development opportunities in your jurisdiction. I guess we'll start with Mark and then work our way down. Great. Thank you, Raj. Um, we've got a couple of, of uh, pretty exciting projects happening um, in Howard County. The first of which many of you are, are, are aware of is Maple Lawn Farm in southern Howard County. Um, this traditional neighborhood design project on the commercial side, on the, on the residential side is doing very well, on the commercial side is, is literally on fire. Uh, St. John Properties is, is extremely off, uh, active. They've got a new 104,000 square foot building. Um, they've got another 102,000 square foot building under construction um, that'll deliver in the spring of 2018, um, as well as a 30,000 square foot medical office building. And additionally, a, a new 103 room uh, residence in is being developed there. So that's a very exciting project. Another project that's um, really in the heart of the corridor is Annapolis Junction Town Center. It's a uh, transit-oriented design project um, right on the Mark Rail. Um, it was the county's first TIF project. We built um, with TIF funding um, a 650 uh, space garage. Um, that project has a 100,000 square foot office building, again by St. John Properties, um, and a 416 unit apartment project, which recently opened. Um, it is very, very close to, to Fort Meade, easy commute there, and being, uh, I think by virtue of that, uh, very successful moving forward. Um, they've got about 40% already leased, so very exciting projects there. Some more, but in the interest of time, I'll turn it over to my colleagues. <laughs> we'll let Julie uh, go next. Uh, a project that, I don't, know if this is on, but I don't know if you can hear me. So one of the projects that I'd like to talk about is Arundel Gateway that's located just west of Tipton Airport. It's a 252-acre mixed-use uh, uh, site that will have about 2,000 homes and 128,000 square feet of retail. 300,000 square feet of office and a 150 room hotel. Um, in addition to that, other significant development is what I've already mentioned, um, Brandon Wood Shores 3, with almost a million square feet of warehouse space. I'll be real quick with that. Uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna mention four projects that are starting to develop right now or already in process. Uh, one I mentioned previously, <clears throat> the Purple Line Light Rail Transit System it broke ground on August 28th. It's a $2 billion construction project to connect New Carrollton and Bethesda along 16 miles with 21 stations. We also have the new $700 million regional medical center, which is scheduled to break ground on November 30th. The Westphalia Town Center is under construction in Upper Marlboro. It is a 479 acre mixed use project, phase one is to, do, to, to deliver 5.9 million square feet within the next five years. And lastly, the Contera Town Center East in Laurel is scheduled to, to begin construction next year, 2018. The, the Town Center East is 350 acres, and it's already entitled for 12 million square feet of mixed-use development. Great, excellent. Um, and uh, just so you all know, I'm, I'm going to try to squeeze in two more questions here. And uh, I know you all have busy schedules and need to get back. Um, but in your program, you have all the contact information. So if there's anything here where you want to kind of follow up on it, uh, if you need more information, that um, the contact uh, information is in your uh, program. So please be sure to take that with you. Um, so the next question, really quick. Over half of the businesses in the Central Maryland Chamber have 20 or less employees. Can you let these businesses know what small business supports and programs your jurisdiction offers? And I will start with Julie on this one. So one of the um, issues that we see most clearly is when we visit businesses, they're having issues um, finding workforce um, or up they, their workforce needs training. So we've um, continued to expand and really try to get the word out about our workforce training grant program. This is a reimbursable grant up to $1,000 per employee for training. And we've seen a lot of traction with that right now. It's been enabling people to uh, train a new employee so that they can promote them to work on um, or you know, buy new equipment that's more efficient um, in addition to hire new people um, for that. 
Another tool that we've been using is our Arundel Text Tech Defense Toolbox, and that's a combination of a 0% loan program for businesses that are past the startup stage but not quite bankable. Um, also combined with that is the Mentors in Residence program that we have that helps mentor from a marketing as well as legal side and government um, contracting. And that also has a workforce training grant component. We have a sister agency uh, in our office. Uh, it is the Financial Services Corporation. And they're specifically charged with helping small businesses access financing. Beyond that, we have score counselors available to meet with businesses on site. And a big focus we've had of late has been expanding our incubator. We're adding a 3,600 square foot accelerator space, and that's going to open, we have the ribbon cutting ceremony in December. Excellent, thank you, and Mark. Thanks, Raj. Um, we have our small business efforts focused in what we are we, we call the Maryland Center for Entrepreneurship, which is our business incubator and small business resource center. We've got a, a number of uh, programs there. We have 23 resident businesses uh, in the incubator. We have a very uh, active SCORE, SBDC, Entrepreneur and Residence Counseling Services. Um, we have our Howard Tech Council, which has 259 member companies that really creates a pretty dynamic ecosystem uh, with training, with mentoring, with events and networking. Um, and then we have our Catalyst Loan Program, which um, has approved since its inception 42 loans with $6.2 million um, uh, deployed to help small businesses. Similarly, that, that pre-bankable business, my colleague Beth Woodring is sitting there. If you, you would like to meet Beth, she's right there and uh, happy to help out. Um, finally, um, this, this last year and the prior year, our team was very focused on the recovery efforts in Ellicott City and Main Street. And I'm pleased to report to you today that uh, um, with, with the help of our colleagues at the county, we, we set up a small business resource center down there. Um, my other calling, co colleague, Catherine Badola, is here. She really um, led our charge on Main Street, and um, Main Street is back. If you haven't been there, come down. We've got some great new um, restaurants, shops, but also um, uh, the existing businesses that were there before the flood um, are up and running and doing better than ever. So with that, that's great. our small business portfolio. Excellent, thank you. So and here's the last one. I'm actually, I'm gonna give you two questions and you could pick e either one you want um, since we're not gonna get to both. Uh, so if you have more to say about one over the other, go with it. Um, the first question is, strategic partnerships are becoming more and more important. Can you describe the purpose and outcome of any recent or upcoming trade missions? That's question one, or you can option, you can opt for uh, question number two. Uh, any new exciting initiatives, programs, or areas of focus on the horizon that you would like uh, the Central Maryland businesses to be aware of? Um, David, we'll go with you. Sure, I'll, I'll uh, <clears throat> take a stab at the one with strategic partnerships. At the, at the Economic Development Corporation in Prince George's, we we've had a major focus on international trade missions, and to date, We've had the most success with attracting businesses from India to establish a U.S. beachhead in the United States. <clears throat> most of the businesses, and we've done, we, we have 12 already that have relocated. And I say relocated, they've expanded to the U.S. The, um, we're, we're reaching out to other countries, but this is the one that, that's really standing out at the time. And we have another trade mission coming up in February. So um, one um, partnership that we've just recently announced last week, and some of you might have been there, is that we're partnered with Southwest Airlines, and it's a new program called Runway to Success. Um, the data is very clear that face-to-face -face business is still the best way to grow your business. Um, conference calls are great, but there's nothing like meeting with those people in person. So we've launched this partnership with Southwest Airline where we will be giving um, businesses who, you know, there's an application process, um, free tickets round trip to go to conferences or do face-to-face -face meetings um, in the effort to um, expand contracts or relationships outside of the state. Um, another 
partnership that we are working on is related to fulfilling cyber jobs in the county. Um, this is a broader effort on a, um, a federal, state, and local um, level as well as multi-state. Um, we're looking at um, some universities in the um, United States that already have pre-cleared programs um, for students graduating. So they're, they're easily hired into some of our um, tech businesses given that those are the, you know, every if you go to Lockheed Martin, they'll tell you they have 100 jobs open right now if they can have cleared people. So this is a, an effort to look at those programs at those other universities to see how we can bring that to the University of Maryland and help our businesses in this regional area. Great, and Mark, you get the last word. Thank you, Raj. We, um, as, as I speak to you today, our county executive, Alan Kittleman, and, and our CEO, Larry Tweel, are actually sending greetings from Europe. They're on a trade mission um, and will, in the next few days, be, be, uh, will be announcing a major um, North American headquarters location for a company from Italy. Um, they're also going to Germany to, for a meeting with a German um, strategic research and development organization that wants to expand its presence here and is looking at Howard County, where we will be moving our Maryland Center for Entrepreneurship to um, Columbia Gateway, our 900-plus acre business park at 175 and I-95. Um, the county has, uh, will be, um, we will be expanding our operations there from now about 25,000 square feet to about 50,000 square feet to create the anchor of what we're looking at long term as an innovation district in Columbia Gateway. So it's very exciting, um, a lot more news to come, so stay tuned. Um, we're very excited about what's going on in Howard County. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. I want to thank our panelists for speaking very quickly.